right, let's continue with the second greatest story ever told. Why is this story important? I've been thinking about that myself for a long time. And I think I have satisfactory answers. But it seems to me that economists have not succeeded in explaining the operation of the market in relation uh, to the bill circulation. The world is sold on the quantity theory of money. And the quantity theory of money is a dead end street for the following reason. It's a linear model. And the world is non-linear. The world is highly non-linear and especially money and the operation of the monetary system is non-linear. And for that reason the quantity theory cannot possibly succeed except as a very limited first approximation. But the first hitch and the theory goes haywire. So I think our effort to, in trying to understand bill circulation, the origin of the real bill, is important because it gives you this possibility that you are not in the straight jacket of the quantity theory of money. Now, we covered ch three chapters of this <laughs> so-called second greatest story and we had the four protagonists I don't repeat it but now we come to chapter four and the title could be how was this counting invented the weaver on cloth merchant bill was very well suited to play the role of means of exchange. The cloth merchant came into daily contact with the gold coin because he was running a retail operation. So in the course of his business uh, gold was flowing through his cash box. That's, that was not the case with the weaver and the spinner and the contact between gold and these other tradesmen was much more sporadic. Often the cloth merchant found himself in the position that he could prepay his bills. Uh, let's remember, all the bills on this particular trade were drawn on the cloth merchant. So there were these bills out there, they were maturing, and then he had to pay them at maturity. But it could be that certain times, at certain times, his business was more brisk and gold coins flowed to him faster than he had anticipated. So he ended up with unexpected piles of gold coins. So the problem arose, what could he do? have these gold coins just lay idle and do nothing. They came 
the cloth merchant, I remind you I said it before, saying it again, was a very clever man, he realized that this was a waste. There should be an efficient way of putting these gold coins back into circulation. But the bills haven't matured yet, they haven't come back to him. So he was thinking and he came to the conclusion why couldn't he take the initiative? Just don't sit there and wait until the bills come back and uh, uh, have these gold coins do nothing in the meantime. He should take the initiative and, and put these gold coins back into circulation. So as I say, he was a very shrewd man with a perfect grasp of the reality that moved merchandise in one direction while the bills were moving in the opposite direction. The cloth merchant would prepay the bills he has accepted but only for a consideration. In other words, he sent out the word to the weaver, spinner, uh, cotton merchant, you have some bills drawn on me, they are not matured yet, but I have the gold to pay you. However, since a prepayment is involved, I want a cut. I will give you the gold for a consideration, because it's prepaid. You see, I, I'm trying to be very careful here because, as you can gather by now, this count is going to come in, but this is very, very different from interest, and that's what I uh, want to avoid, that anybody would confuse the two. So it's important that if you prepay your bill, there's no interest involved, you prepay because there is to be a consideration. The bill is not mature yet, but you are willing to give, if these fellows, the other guys, the spinner, the weaver, the cloth merchant, are in need of gold, they should give you a consideration for getting that gold from you, because you are not yet obliged to surrender that gold. So, in more details, whenever people asked the cloth merchant to prepay a bill before maturity, as the weaver often did, and so did the spinner, he would offer to discount the bill. That is to say, would not pay the face value, but somewhat less than the face value before maturity. The weaver didn't object to receiving a little less than the face value of the bill because he needed the ready cash and he could not get it on any better term from any other source than discounting the bill of the cloth merchant before maturity. For his part, the cloth uh, merchant wanted the custom of the weaver. He was his supplier and he was also supplying the bills for his discount business. So he would offer the best terms to him. The cloth merchant would offer the best possible terms to the weaver for discounting the bill. The, uh, and I remind you the word discounting simply means prepaying, to pay cash for the maturing bill which is not quite mature yet, but you are willing to pay, prepay it nevertheless for a consideration. The discount was an income for him that the gold coins in his till could not otherwise generate. That's just what I said, that the cloth merchant had 
uh, they, he looked at this pile of gold and said they are just sitting there doing nothing, he should uh, change that. And the discount then became an income for the cloth merchant which the gold would generate if he put this idea into practice. Clearly, both parties benefited from discounting. After this latest innovation, people no longer talked about paying a bill, they talked about discounting it. So the origin of discount is in, merch, in, in this particular trade. It's a, it's a merchant custom. The sale of cloth by the weaver to the, clo uh, to the cl uh, cloth merchant is not final until the bill is marked paid. That's when the cycle is complete, the cycle of the movement of the maturing merchandise to the customer. The cloth is on consignment. Payment at maturity is subject to the sale of cloth to the ultimate cash paying customer. Payment before maturity is certainly not a matter of right, it's a matter for negotiation. So the question arises, what determines the height of the discount? Well, obviously time is a factor, right? The longer is left to maturity, the higher the amount of discount will be. But is this the only consideration? No, it's not because it, and that's the important and uh, perhaps a little more difficult to grasp uh, this, this uh, aspect of it. The height of the discount depends on the intensity of consumer demand. If the consumer demand is high, then the cloth merchant will be able to accept a lower discount rate. On the other hand, if the consumer demand is slack, then he is not all too anxious to prepay the bill the maturing bill. Of course at maturity there's no question he has to pay, but this is, remember, a question of prepayment. So that's the important thing to understand. Consumer demand, the intensity of consumer demand has to do with the height of the discount rate. And there is a good way to express this by saying, just introduce the concept of propensity to consume, just like we can talk about propensity to save, we can talk about propensity to consume. This is a notion which describes the intensity of consumer demand. If the propensity is high, this means that uh, consumers are competing for the goods and there is no problem for the cloth merchant to dispose of his inventory over a period of time. On the other hand, the consumer demand could be slack. We describe this by saying that the propensity to consume is lower. And the relationship between the discount rate and the propensity to consume is inverse. The higher the propensity to consume, the lower the discount rate. And conversely, the lower the propensity to consume, the higher the discount rate. Well, you have to think over this process why the cloth merchant finds it to insist on a higher discount rate when the propensity 
is low. It means that the movement of the cloth is slower. He can expect that inventory will sit on the shelves for a longer period of time. So he is not anxious to prepay his bills. He would still prepay it, but he would demand his price, which is the higher discount rate. So if the demand is brisk, then the acceptor of the bill, who still has an unsold uh, inventory on hand to worry about, uh, uh, he would have to carry it entirely at his own risk. So he will insist on a larger discount. He wants to be compensated for the increased risk of carrying inventory that he may not be able to sell except at a loss. This can also happen. Soon enough, the cloth merchant started posting his discount rate. He just uh, said, for example, that if uh, the amount of discount in cents would be uh, okay. Discount rate: the amount of discount in cents per one hundred dollar value per day. Uh, I messed it up. I just repeat it. He would say how much discount he would take out of uh, the face value of a maturing bill. The time has to come in, so he would say per day. So for every $100 face value, he would charge a discount in cents, which is one, uh, uh, okay, 100 of $1. And he would multiply this with the number of days left to maturity on the bill. So let's give an example. If the discount rate is four cents, then the bill of face value of fifteen hundred dollars, which would mature in fifty days' time, will be discounted to uh, to uh, one hundred and fourteen hundred and seventy dollars. Well, now I will need the thing, but you will get it in prints, and uh, I I just don't want to go through this method. It's very straightforward. What you do is you multiply the four cent by the number of days and subtract this uh, from the uh, face value which is 1500 and you end up with $1,470. So the, uh, I think I, um, I just let it go and uh, if you want to ask questions uh, there will be opportunity. If we make this available, is the copying machine working? Not yet. It's not working yet. Well, let, let, okay, let's hope. Who, who hopingly will come tomorrow? Uh, the cloth merchant reserved the right to adjust his posted discount rate from day to day, or if necessary, even during the day, to reflect the changing mood of the consumer. And the rule is always that the discount rate varies inversely with the propensity to consume. The brisker the demand, the lower the rate and vice versa. Now I want to emphasize that there, uh, which I have already emphasized, that there's no lending involved in discounting. As a later development, the discount rate was quoted as an annualized discount rate, and that was the norm. So the, what I said before, four cent a day is one way of quoting the discount rate, but another 
uh, way of quoting it is as the uh, quoted the same way as you quote the interest rate, namely on an annualized basis, what is the amount of discount. Uh, <coughs> Which, uh, which is a little strange because you know that the bill matures in uh, no more than 91 days. So how does the year come in which is 365 days? But you just then annualize it for the purposes of easy comparison. You want to know, so you have a standard uh, way of quoting your discount rate. So for example, if the bill with $100 face value had 91 days to run to maturity and it was discounted to $99.50 then the discount rate was 2% per annum. And why? Because 4 times 91 days, uh, that's one year, okay, four times 91 is one year, and therefore on an annualized basis the discount rate is four times 100 minus 99.50, which is uh, four times one half, uh, one half dollar, which is two percent. Uh, and again, you will get that in print, so you can go through the arithmetic, and I'm very happy to offer my help if, if uh, you have questions. Yes? Could I clarify something just before you move sure, on? Uh, sure. What you said about the uh, propensity, <coughs> the discount rate varying inversely with the propensity to consume. Is it accurate for me to say if I am the uh, spinner and I have a real bill drawn on the merchant, and I can see that consumer demand is slackening, uh, that is, is it also true to say that that's why I'd be willing to accept um, if you were paying me back a, a higher discount rate if you were prepaying me because I'm now maybe concerned about the, I don't want to say credit quality because you said it's not a loan. I want to make sure I'm using the right terms here, but is that sort of the other half of that? Like you said, the one half of it, if, if consumer demand is brisk and he has all, and the merchant has all the gold coins lying around, he would want to prepay it to put his gold back to work. But the other side of that is if he's strapped for gold because the, the products aren't being bought, maybe I'm now getting a little nervous about the bill that I've, I'm holding and I'm willing to say, okay, instead of a 2% discount, it'll be a 3% discount if you prepay it, uh, or you know, equivalent, uh, annual mm. equivalent, 3% discount. Is that, is, um, is my understanding correct of the market force? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready okay. to answer. Yeah. Um, uh, the difficulty is that the spinner is a bit too far removed from the consumer. So he is not the judge. He's not much of a judge anyhow. He has only indirect input. The judge is the cloth merchant who is in daily contact with the consumer. So. The leader is the cloth merchant. The spinner is a follower. And uh, you mentioned that he is worried about the safety of his money. I, I think this doesn't enter. This doesn't enter it. it uh, I mean, they all see that the merchandise is moving. It's moving. And as long as it is moving, there is no question that he will be paid. Because if anybody stops paying, then the whole thing, you know, I mean, the, all the profit opportunities for all these merchants will go up in smoke if anybody stops the flow. So as long as it's flow, flowing, no worry about getting paid in time, on time. All right. So I would say the spinner has a choice. He doesn't have to pre uh, uh, ask for prepayment, but he's offered an opportunity of prepayment of the bill. So he looks at it and says, well, is it worth my while? Do I have a good place to put that gold coin? And in view of that, he will make a decision. 
and perhaps he has a good way and then it will be an added incentive for him to, pre, uh, to ask for prepayment. But lacking such an incentive, he might just say, well, let, let just the thing run to maturity. And on the other hand, this could put pressure on the cloth merchant, who would say, well, they didn't bite, so I give them more incentive. He would raise the discount rate. You see, this is the kind of give and take. They, uh, the beauty of it, and we come to this uh, uh, shortly, is that this is extremely sensitive. The uh, classical economists, including Mises, they say that the consumer demand has a feedback to the producer through the price mechanism. Now, if you think of it, you will realize the price mechanism is just too clumsy, too involved, and does not respond fast enough. I'm not saying that this is zero input, because it's obviously more than that, but there's just no comparison between the discount rate adjustment and the price mechanism adjustment. If the merchandise is not moving fast enough and then you lower the price, this is one thing you can do, but it's just not fast enough in comparison. The move of this country is, we'll come back to that. Okay? All right. Now, continuing this discussion, the fact that the discount rate is quoted on an annualized basis, the same way as the rate of interest is quoted, in spite of the fact that the bill will mature long before the year would, a full year would go by, this has led to a curious mistake that was not free from its more ominous consequences. It has been suggested that the discounting of a bill is just another way of making a short-term loan. And the discount is nothing more than a short-term rate of interest, which is collected differently. Now normally if you loan, if you take out a loan, a sum of money, you pay the interest <coughs> excuse me, at the end of the loan period. You return the borrowed sum and add the interest. That's the normal way of paying. Now, the discount, they say, not I say, but the, those who misunderstand this whole process, they would say, the discount is just a rate of interest collected in a different way. Hmm. It's taken out of the loan. So in other words, you get the loan and this, then the interest is taken out of that loan before you get it in your hand. So you borrow a hundred dollars, but you don't get the hundred dollars because the uh, lender will take out the interest in advance. You see, that's what they say. That here is a short-term interest rate which is collected in a different way from the long term. That's the only difference. Mises says that. But I think it's, it's a mistake. There, there is far more involved here and it's certainly no loan and no borrowing involved. <coughs> In this erroneous view, the discount rate is just another name for short-term interest. It would follow that there are no new problems here to study, if you accept that other view. Namely, time preference will explain the whole complex of questions. But this is a mistake, and I would like to re keep repeating that because this is extremely important if you want to understand uh, the whole uh, real bill doctrine. 
the source in, in this erroneous view, the source of discount <coughs> rate is the same as that of the uh, rate of interest, namely time preference, or it's reciprocal, the propensity to save, and that is wrong. The source is not saving, the source is clearing, the source of credit is clearing, and the rate is the reciprocal, not of the propensity to save, but of the propensity to consume. This was one of the most damaging mistakes ever made by economic theoreticians. That's my humble opinion. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of mistakes that have been made in economics, but one of the most damaging was just this misunderstanding, the confusion between uh, the rate of interest and the discount rate. In fact, there is no lending and borrowing involved in the act of discounting. The cloth merchant is not lending and the weaver is not borrowing. Um, I'm, uh, I should have said the other way around. The clothier, the cloth merchant, is not borrowing and the weaver is not lending. <coughs> Nor is the cloth merchant retiring a loan owed to the weaver when the uh, bill matures and the uh, face value of the bill is paid. The discount rate has nothing to do with time preference or its reciprocal, the propensity to save. It has everything to do with the propensity to consume. All participants, ah, this is a quotation which I like, it's a Shakespeare quotation from the uh, tragedy of Hamlet, and uh, that's what it says, I quote Shakespeare. Uh, these are the words of Polonius to his son Laertes, who is going overseas, and the father is giving him uh, good advice which should help the son through various difficulties. That's what he says, Polonius to his son. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. Just three lines, beautiful and very interesting because most of modern economists, if they look at this and read this, they say, oh, how old-fashioned can be. And old uh, Shakespeare didn't know any economics. He should take our course, Economics 101. That looks to a modern economist. That's the way it looks. But actually, if you stay with these lines a little longer, you will see some very deep wisdom in this. Because, of course, Shakespeare doesn't talk about rate of interest, and still less does he talk about the discount rate. Far from him. But, Lurking behind Shakespeare words is the distinction, which is important. That there are two sources of credit, and they shouldn't be mixed because they are quite separate, they have nothing in common. So I just continue reading. Shakespeare may sound hopelessly outmoded to our ears in the 21st century. Yet, it is quite possible, now I'm hypothesizing, I'm not saying that, you see I'm not a literary expert nor am I, uh, you know, uh, somebody who did more research on this, but it seems to me that there is depth in this, because it's quite possible that Shakespeare saw something that most 
other observers have failed to see. The advice of Polonius is not meant for everybody. If there is a lesson to be learned from the endless disputes about usury, usurers, and about the advantages and disadvantages of lending or borrowing, then it must be the following. To make or take a loan is an art. It's not just business, it's more than business. <coughs> you have to have a little bit of ingenuity. More than a routine, uh, more than a routinist would have. A routinist uh, would act mechanically, but you've got to put in something little extra. <clears throat> to make or take a loan is an art that cannot be profitably culti cultivated just by anybody. To this art no less than any other, has to be learned, practiced, refined, rehearsed by both the lender and the borrower, each on his own turf. Implicit in Shakespeare's line is the fact that not every form of credit may involve a loan, lending or borrowing. Not every form of credit. Some do, some don't. But if you want to involve a loan, lending or borrowing, then you have to have this little bit of extra in you, which would make you more than just a, a routinist, a businessman who is acting pretty well mechanically. So it is precisely that form of credit we are studying here which the routinist does, where you don't need to be an artist. You are just a trained businessman who can do the more mechanical part. So in other words, the two sources of credit, lending and borrowing, saving on the one hand, clearing and discounting bills, which is the, for the routine, somebody who does not claim to be an artist. That's the discount, that's the trade, buying and selling, being a link in this chain to provide the consumer with uh, consumer goods. But when it comes to, to uh, uh, lending and borrowing, you have to have this extra. Now these are my thoughts and you don't have to buy it because as I say uh, I, I just like this Shakespeare and I don't want to believe for a moment that Shakespeare was and, 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 uh, um, economic ignoramus. I just don't don't buy. There is depth in this somehow. Perhaps I'm reading it into it. I don't know. You are. You can be the judge, um, and you may read it and put your own interpretation on this. Uh, and I don't want to pursue this any further because uh, there is no profit in it. I just <laughs> it, it seems to me that I I have to take off my hat before the genius of Shakespeare, and I don't like uh, the, this uh, effort to put him, to paint him as, as somebody who is, whose thinking is uh, outmoded. Yes, I just like to say the word he uses: husbandry. Husbandry means to take care of things properly, to maintain them for the next generation, for so on. And the, the people who borrow money into existence today have no husbandry. They don't care about the next generation. I think it's right spot on what's happening today. You are talking about today. I'm talking about today. There's no husbandry. There's only borrowing. Yeah. And the, and the, the, but, the fine edge of husbandry is gone. Yeah, but let's put ourselves back into the time of Shakespeare. In his time, 
Would you say that there was a little husbandry in, uh, in borrowing? Mm. Well, I, the way I see it is, if it's your own stuff, you take good care of it, and you have husbandry. But if it's somebody yeah. else's, maybe you don't give it the same yeah. attention. Yeah. Okay, I will circulate this and you read it, think about it, and I will be happy if you let me know what you think. Uh, Mine is certainly not the final <laughs> word about that, and maybe we are the only one in the whole world who worried about the Shakespeare quotation as far as its relevance to economics is concerned. Uh, but, uh, you know, these were the thoughts which were, uh, uh, which uh, were, um, uh, moving me to, to to try something uh, to find the balance between art and science. So let's just leave it for the moment. I don't mind coming back to it if you think, if you feel that you have something serious to add to it. But you have to think about it. This is not something that you can you can. Uh, uh, decide in a moment's spur. So, credit can and does arise independently of lending and borrowing. In particular, the act of clearing is a source of credit. When the weaver draws a bill on the cloth merchant, he is extending credit, yet he is not a lender and the cloth merchant is not a borrower. Nor should the transaction consummated between the two be regarded as a loan. The perception that the drawer of the bill, in this case uh, the uh, uh, weaver, grants a loan to the acceptor of the bill, which in this case is the cloth merchant, when he delivers the good against payment in the form of the bill accepted, or the perception that the acceptor repays the loan to the drawer when he discounts the same bill before it matures, is entirely fallacious and must be resisted. This I just keep repeating, I'm sorry, I may be boring, but that's uh, very, very important. To, and it, uh, you have to mull over and over this again to see that this is the case. Uh, the credit is an integral part of the deal between the weaver and the cloth merchant. It's a part of the deal. The prices which uh, tradesmen who process a semi-finished good in uh, moving to the consumer, these are quoting prices but never ever, or perhaps I should say hardly ever, but I am willing to say never ever cash prices. When you deliver the good to the retailer, the price you quote is a discountable price. Normally it's payable in 91 days. These are the terms. It's built in. As I say, never ever would the wholesaler quote a cash price to the retailer because that's useless. I mean, the retailers don't pay cash for consignment of goods which they want to sell. There is always a term involved. So, by virtue of the momentum of the underlying merchandise moving sufficiently fast to the ultimate consumer, these prices which the wholesalers quote are discountable prices, not cash prices. So where is the loan? There's no loan. You just deliver the good and quote a price which is to be paid after the underlying merchandise has been sold 
to the ultimate consumer. And it's the gold coin of the ultimate consumer which is going to liquidate that uh, obligation. But it's not a loan and there's no borrowing involved. As I say, that's very important to understand. By st standard merchant custom, the terms 91 days net quotation, 91 days net, that's written on the face of the bill. It could be less, not more, but 91 days net are part of every such commercial deal stated. Otherwise, prices quoted by the wholesaler to the retailer are discountable prices. The amount of discount depends on time, the number of days left to maturity, and on the discount rate prevailing at the time of payment. And we have discussed this. It has to do with the propensity to consume. Time preference that determines the rate of interest has absolutely nothing to do with the discount rate. Discounting is not governed by the saver. I very often add the sovereign saver because saver is a very important player in this drama, a very important actor. But when it comes to discounting, he has no say about that. That's not his department. This is an entirely different thing. It has to do with clearing rather than saving. So we are not belittling the importance of the saver when we observe that. We just want to set up a theory which is free from error from start. And if we start mixing up the two concepts, it becomes so entangled a little later that it will be impossible to see through. But if from the start we keep these two separate, there are two sources of credit, saving and clearing, then we are on solid grounds and we are not in danger, or not as great a danger to make a mistake later on. So, uh, discounting is governed by, not by the sovereign saver, but by the sovereign consumer. As we have seen, it is the consumer's slacker or brisker buying that makes the discount rate rise or fall. We express this by saying that the discount rate varies inversely with the propensity to consume. I mean this is just a concise way, way of describing what is happening. The consumer buying could be brisk or slack and you just look at the consequences. But Rather than saying this in several sentences, you can say it in one sentence if you introduce the term as we have propensity to consume. By the way, I've been criticized that I borrowed the phrase from Keynes, but of course Keynes... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the propensity oh, right. to save and propensity to consume was introduced by Keynes. But I don't feel uh, restricted in my freedom to choose any words which I find uh, best to describe a certain situation. Even the devil himself used it before. <laughs> <laughs> So by contrast, the rate of interest varies inversely with the propensity to save. The discount rate varies inversely with the propensity to consume. The conceptual difference between the two rates was observed by uh, the uh, English uh, economist John Fullerton 
who wrote an important book in uh, the 19th, middle of the 19th century with the title on regulation of currencies. This is what he said. It is a great error indeed to imagine that the demand for the loan of capital is identical with the demand for additional means of circulation or even that the two are frequently associated. It's a, it's a great error. Each demand originates in circumstances peculiarly affecting itself and very dist and vary and, and they are distinct from one another. It is when everything looks prosperous, when wages are high, prices are on the rise and factories are busy, then an additional supply of currency is usually required, whereas it is chiefly in a more advanced stage of the commercial cycle when difficulties begin to present themselves, when markets are overstocked, returns are delayed, interest rises and pressure comes back, comes on the bank for advances of capital. That was a little bit too long. Frenchmen are better with words than Englishmen. A uh, Frenchman by the name Charles Rist, a very good uh, French economist, uh, described the same idea as a one-liner. This is what he said identification of the discount rate with the interest rate which is frequent among English writers <laughs> is an unfortunate source of confusion. Now, why is it that the Real Bill's doctrine is so violently, so vehemently attacked by the majority of economists. And I think we just want to address that problem before we adjourn today. The reason is because the Real Bill's doctrine challenges the quantity theory of money, which is pretty well accepted as a dogma by most, not all, but most economists. The idea that the bill of exchange can circulate on its own wings and under its own power is ridiculed by advocates of the quantity theory of money. The vicious attacks of monetarists, this is the followers of Milton Friedman, on the real bills doctrine mark the Achillean heel. Now you know Achilles in the Greek mythology was invincible except one point of his body which was his heel because he was submerged in uh, this um, uh, pond of water which gave him this invincibility but forget who immersed him but he had to hold Achilles somehow so he held him <laughs> grabbing his heel and that's the part of his body which was not touched by that water. So Achilles was invincible except if you knew that he could be hurt. He was vulnerable at his heel. So uh, my sentence is that the vicious attacks of monetarists on the real doctrine is the Achillean heel of the quantity theory of money. That's the only part which hurts. It's vulnerable. Theory is vulnerable right there when the real bills doctrine is brought 
into the question. This shows that an increase in the quantity of purchasing media need not cause a rise in prices. So just think back a little uh, what we discussed that the uh, maturing merchandise is approaching the market and gives rise, this movement gives rise to bill circulation. Now, undoubtedly, when you increase, when you put a bill into circulation, you increase uh, purchasing media. But will it result in a rise of prices? Of course not, because the merchandise is just emerging and the purchasing media, the extra purchasing the bill is emerging at the same time so there will be no price increase because what happens is that the extra purchasing power which is created is going to be met with the additional merchandise for which it can be sold. So that's the most straightforward refutation of the quantity theory of money. It doesn't always happen that an increase in the quantity of purchasing media will cause a rise in prices and that's just the perfect example of that. And it's not an exception, not a rare example, it's a common occurrence every day. Whenever production is financed in the right way, production of consumer goods is financed the right way, the maturing consumer good, the movement corresponds to the circulation of the real bill. Then there is an example when purchasing media is added to the money supply, yet there is no, necessar uh, there is no necessary price increase involved. If the new purchasing media emerges simultaneously with the new merchandise and the two dis disappear together as the merchandise is sold to the ultimate consumer, then the financing of the production and distribution of consumer goods uh, through bills of exchange will not give occasion to any price rises on account of an increase in the bill circulation. And that's the sense of it, the real bills doctrine. That this is a sound way of financing production of the most uh, urgently demanded consumer goods. No price rise. The consumer demand could be very, very high and according to the classical theory this should give uh, occasion to price increases, but it won't and it shouldn't because the emerging merchandise is financed through the emerging bills. And the two, not only that they emerge together, but it's also very important that the two expire together because uh, when the bill matures, by that time the uh, consumer good will have been sold to the ultimate consumer. <coughs> Detractors of the real bill doctrine argue that several bills can be drawn on the same merchandise. So here is a merchandise, say a semi-finished product which is moving to the consumer and then the spinner will draw a bill on this and the weaver will draw a bill on this 
and the wholesaler will draw a bill and it's just the one merchandise and three bills representing three times the approximate value of this merchandise uh, have been drawn on just the one. So that's inflation, they say. However, this is fraud. The, 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 they have no right. One has the right, and normally it's the retailer. Um, I mean, the wholesaler draws a bill on the retailer, and that's the only bill which is involved. And we come to that uh, tomorrow, discussing the bill market, and uh, uh, you will see that the bill market is a wonderful policeman. It doesn't allow fraud to uh, prevail. In contrast to the banking system where all the bills have been intercepted by the bank and they are sheltered in the bank portfolio. The bank gives out the loan and then these bills which should be circulating and exposed to public criticism and even rejection because some bills are rejected, fraudulently constructed bills. Uh, the, market, uh, the bill market has a way to see that there are several bills drawn on the same merchandise. But when the banks take over, as it's in their interest to do, because they want to skim off the cream, you know, they want the best uh, and the most secure income, then the fraudulent bills are sheltered in the bank portfolio. It's no longer open to public scrutiny. But what Adam Smith is talking about is bills circulating and exposed to public scrutiny. They are not hidden, they are not sheltered in the bank portfolio. A very important distinction indeed. <coughs> So we have no objection. Yes, that can be ha that can happen. It can happen that more bills are drawn on just the one piece of merchandise. And that would be inflation. However, that's fraud. And you can't argue that since fraud is possible, therefore a certain institution has to be rejected. I mean on that basis all institutions can be rejected because fraud is possible in even the most uh, intricate with all the most intricate security measures. So you can't dismiss the real bills doctrine because there is possibility for fraud. If there is, and there is, we know then the answer is to improve detection facilities and we'll talk about this uh, later on. Uh, so as I have pointed out uh, only the most liquid of these bills which are possible to draw which is the uh, a wholesaler's bill uh, drawn on the retailer, these should enter that bill trading which is involved in they do the financing of uh, the trip of the maturing merchandise to the ultimate consumer. So that's one measure how you can make sure that the uh, fraud has less scope. You will be suspicious if you see a bill uh, of the spinner drawn on the weaver. That's a red light. You have to investigate this case because there, what's the reason that it's not a wholesaler on retailer bill? It's a 
spinner on weaver bill. Uh, there uh, are fraudulent bills and they are usually called pig on pork bills. <laughs> pig on pork bills. So I, I just mentioned this. Spinner on weaver. Wholesaler on retailer. These, uh, as I say, the, the first mentioned, uh, I mean, the wholesaler on retailer bill gives you a measure of security that this bill is not fraudulent. I'm not saying other bills cannot be drawn, and if they are drawn, they are fraudulent, but you have to be more careful with them if you, if you meet them. So, uh, the, and again, the first order, second order, etc. Uh, classification of uh, semi-finished goods come in. We are talking about the second order good becoming a first order good, and there is a bill there. This is closer to the consumer, the ultimate consumer. So that's uh, extra gives you extra security. If it's more remote, then you have to be careful. So there are several ways of looking at this and improving security, which is a technical question, but I just mentioned that there is a solution, and you can't just dismiss the real doctrine because there fraud is possible. It is, but fraud is possible any, in on any other walk of life. <coughs> now, demand for real bills. Still have ten minutes. We have seen that the spinner and the cotton dealer were happy to hold the weaver on cloth merchant bill to maturity. As soon as discounting became a universal practice, the demand for these bills has greatly increased because there were other merchants, other tradesmen, which were even outside of this circle of producing the cloth. Could be producing foodstuffs or something else who could represent demand for these bills. And the example I want to give you is, think of a seasonal kind of business, such as a fuel merchant. Uh, in the winter time there is greater demand for fuel than in the summertime, so what happens is that there are fuel merchants in an area who have to increase their physical inventory of fuel, could be coal or firewood or oil or what have you, and they have to finance this so there is an increase in bill circulation in the winter time. However, come summer, the demand for fuel decreases quite predictably, but as it does, the uh, as it does, the um, uh, bills drawn on fuel, the supply of bills drawn on fuel shrinks. Obviously, less inventory, so. Uh, less, uh, fewer bills uh, drawn on, uh, on the fuel. What does that mean? It means that the few seasonal merchant, in our example of fuel merchant, has extra cash, gold coins, which are lying idle. So, he is looking for an outlet. He cannot invest it in brick and mortar to build houses because he knows 
the, uh, when fall comes, he has to increase his inventory again in preparation for the next winter. So he's looking for a short-term investment possibility. And then there are other seasonal merchants whose high season is not the winter time, as it is for the few, but the summer time. No, I, I don't know. Somebody who is uh, selling uh, flower seeds or plants or some such thing. Do you, you can pick your own example. Uh, so in other words, there are seasonal merchants, one type with high season in the winter, the other type high season in the summer. So they complement each other. There's a symbiosis between the two. When the uh, fuel merchant enters into his high season, the uh, seed uh, merchant enters his low season, so he has the extra cash and it's obvious that he's going to invest it into the bills of the, of the fuel merchant and vice versa. And there are any number of examples you can think of uh, which are very convincing and you see this kind of thing. So in other words there is a demand for these bills. Uh, there are all kinds of cases where you cannot invest long term, you have to invest short term and, and uh, then it's the bill market where you go and buy the bills of merchants which are in their high season. So there is such a thing as a real demand for real bills. Usually an earning asset is illiquid. Bonds are illiquid. There's no question. There's a big spread between the bid price and the ask price. And therefore it's not advisable that if you have short term funds to invest, it's not advisable to go to the bond market. Your question earlier referred to this and I suggested that my answer would involve the higher liquidity of bills which shows up as a smaller spread between the ask and the in fact I would be willing to go so far as suggesting that the spread is so small that it's practically zero. Not zero exactly, but for trading purposes it's so small that it's not worth bothering to collect the spread. You could collect it, but it would just make the uh, trading more cumbersome. It's not worth it. And that's what, <coughs> what what's the case with bill trading. And therefore, as I say, the demand for these real bills which are put into circulation, which finance the movement of semi-finished goods which moving fast enough to the ultimate consumer, the ideal vehicle for other merchants which are entering their slow season, so they have an increasing pile of cash, gold coins, which cannot be invested just anywhere. It has to be invested in the bill trade. And that's a nature provided solution to the nature provided problem. Okay? The symbiosis of different traders. They just a perfect match, the supply and demand, supply of real bills and demand for real bills. The bills never ever, let's be careful, hardly ever go bagging. But if you float a bond issue, any number of examples will show you that they could go bagging. 
and in many cases they withdraw the issue because there is no market for them they find out and sometimes this cannot be even predicted it's just a matter of trial and error you want to raise capital for some very promising enterprise and you don't know the only way to find out is to float the bond and if there's no demand for it too bad you have to withdraw it this wouldn't happen with bills why because your starting point is that there is a consumer demand which is urgent enough that the semi-finished goods will move fast enough if that condition is not there then there's no bill drawn because those people who are involved they know the trade they know that how much bread is going to be consumed in a day and they know that perhaps in the winter they consume more bread than in the summer or the other way I don't know but they know their trade they know that the consumer demand is there if they didn't know they wouldn't uh, touch those bills the fact that they do touch the bills and the bills are drawn is a proof that the consumer demand is there of course disaster could happen earthquake flood or whatever which change the picture but these are short-term instruments and that means that adjustments are being made in stride you don't have to wait because the bills if any disaster happens you take into account and if it's not immediately self-correcting at least it's correcting itself within the short term all right so I have to stop here and we'll continue tomorrow we are not yet finished with the second greatest story ever told and I'm looking forward to hearing from you whether you agree with me that the story is at least a great story if not the second greatest but at least a great story so I'm uh, just uh, saying it tongue-in-chief second greatest story but it certainly is a great story I think how you see this is natural I, I cannot help but look at this that all the engineering and so on you couldn't devise this system and this wasn't devised by anybody this grew up this just by trial and error economics produced that bill market it's absolutely spontaneous there's no artificial all the banks and bond trading and so on they are artificial in comparison but this is just natural nature provides the problem but nature also provides the answer and they fit like hand in glove it's amazing it's you really have to uh, I, I don't expect I can convince you in half an hour but if you think about this if you read our handouts which will hopefully you will have tomorrow and go home and think about it and so I think you will come to the conclusion that this is a great story and it's great because it's nature it's natural it's not contrived it's not artificial it's just as perfect as nature can be uh, that's how I feel and I hope I can <laughs> pass it on to you yes it gives me a lot of hope um, when you remind me that it was a natural uh, development that sprung up because I know when Rob Landis uh, I don't remember the name of his essay but he wrote it a couple of years ago where he, where he called the, he said you have the 100% gold standard uh, believers and then Professor Fekete and his merry band of heretics, or whatever he called, uh, however he put it, and he said, with their real bills doctrine, he said, but it's too complicated, people won't understand it, we need to go back to 100% gold standard, that's the only thing that people understand. <laughs> it gives me a lot of confidence, because really, what the fact of the matter is, that if the government ever gets out of the way, and doesn't try to impose some sort of solution, then the proper solution will automatically appear, because the real bills doctrine will 
uh, reflect. It's so flexible. It couldn't be more flexible. It's, it's just amazing, you know. And the adjustment is almost instantaneous. The price system is sluggish. It's very, uh, it takes time to adjust and so on. But the discount rate, we'll talk about this more. I mean, it's very little what we have covered so far. But we are going to continue. And then you will see that uh, it's like a soap bubble, or better still, if you make a frame like this and submerge it into a soapy solution and take it out then the film of soap will appear and this has very interesting properties it's a so-called minimal surface which means that with that given contour there is no other surface which would have a smaller surface area. But that's beside the point. My point is that if you have such a f soapy film and introduce a disturbance here, all points will be affected almost instantaneously. Well, I'm not bringing in the speed of light, but something quite similar. It's going to show up at every... So that's the same way production is if you have this way of financing. Cutout banks just have this interaction between the individual actors. It's, it's amazing. Just as amazing as, as this... Uh, uh, minimal surface construction. You know, it's uh, mathematically, it's a partial differential equation which would give you the solution if you want to write down equations. And it's most difficult to find the solution. It's not about with today, high speed computers will make it easier. But when I was a university student, uh, you know, it was a terribly complicated problem to solve a partial differential equation of second order. Yet, nature provides a solution because you just take the frame, submerge it into a soapy solution, pull it out, bingo! There is your minimal surface which mathematicians could work day and day and night. And even I'm not sure, I'm not a computer scientist, but I wouldn't be surprised if they found out that the fastest computers would still take a couple of days to come up with the solution. And nature can... Right. So th this, is, this is the thing. The bill market is similar to that. Yes? The word I will use is an emergent phenomenon. It comes out naturally from what's underlying chaos, sure. so-called chaos. Chaos. And there's a whole science out there studying these emergent phenomena. Emergent. Every time, under the same conditions, same result comes. If you take your soap bubble thing, same every time. So I guess the uh, real bill stuff will come if it's not resisted or crushed by something else. It's an emergent phenomenon. That's right. So we don't have to understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. See you tomorrow. Oh, uh, Derek will take over the last period tomorrow from 4.30 to 6. And we are looking forward to hearing him. It's not uh, directly related to the topic of the course, but I thought it's topical, it has to do with the present crisis and the solution, and as I say, I'm very happy to have him, uh, and we take our time for a little change of pace. Tomorrow, Daryl Shun will be our lecturer, uh, speaker.
I'll take it personally if no one shows up. <laughs>